Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you happen to be. It's sunny and 24 degrees Celsius. That'd be about 75 on the Fahrenheit scale here on the Atlantic Ocean in beautiful Hackett's Cove, Nova Scotia. You're listening to a Nautel webinar, Tips and Tricks, How Not to Blow Stuff Up. I'm your host, Jeff Welton. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to discuss things like safety, how to get home at the end of the day. We're going to talk a little bit about grounding, how much is too much, how much is not enough, some tips and tricks on how to do it. A little bit about IT security. That's becoming more and more a pretty uh, important item, especially as we get uh, more equipment that's connected to the worldwide nastiness. And, of course, a little bit about maintenance. Sometimes it's easier to spend a little, save a lot, before the fires start. So before we start all this, we're going to do a few housekeeping things. You should have a control panel on your screen. If you don't, there should be an orange arrow there where you can expand the dashboard, and uh, that way you can see the question and answer window. Well, question window, I should say. You can enter your windows in the text box, hit send. What we'll probably do, we'll run through about 35, 45 minutes of the presentation. That should bring us pretty close to the end. We'll take all the questions at the end. Anything we don't answer within that time frame, we'll uh, handle by email or after the fact. So by all means, feel free to ask questions. Uh, anybody who's heard me present before knows I tend to be interactive. so. This monologue thing's kind of new to me. We'll see if we can make it work. All right, so on that, the uh, one of the things we're seeing more and more, and I've done this slide more than once, is that the average age of the broadcast engineer is not going down. We're not getting any younger, and there aren't as many young people coming into this industry. That presents several challenges. Uh, number one, there's not as many of us to do the same amount of work, or in some cases, more work. The issue with that becomes that a lot of times we're working longer hours. We're working full-time jobs, doing contract work on the side, or you'll work a day at the studio and do a night at the transmitter site. A lot of times we're working alone without anybody else there. That uh, has risks too for not just the obvious reasons, but some other ones that we'll discuss. And the little things like seeing a lot of the few younger people we do get coming in, a lot of them are IT oriented, which is awesome because there's so much more IT based equipment out there. But it also presents a challenge because we're still dealing with some pretty big voltages. We're dealing with RF, we're dealing with uh, remote locations with safety risks involved with those. And there's some training and experience involved with that that uh, needs to be addressed. So I did a search a few years back on the phrase engineer found dead, which is, uh, I'm here to tell you that's not the most uh, enlightening or um, uplifting topic to be searching on. But uh, th there were quite a few hits. There were more than I expected, more than I wanted. The day that I can do that search and find none will be the day that I figure we've got this figured out. Uh, as I said, more and more we're working alone. We're uh, working after a full day when we're tired, it's easy to blow stuff up when you're tired. Um, I'll probably tell a war story or two. Actually, I will definitely tell a war story or two in the course of this webinar. And one of my favorites, uh, I'm glad you can't see the face I'm making. One of the favorites I've got is the uh, one where I walk into a site after a full day of travel, do a full day of commissioning, and then start doing some product demonstration. And this is all fine, but at this point I'm 16, 17 hours awake and shouldn't be working at all and ended up uh, in the process of trying to show how an exciter could uh, come back up after a failure. I uh, pulled the um, crystal, plugged it back in while the exciter was trying to come up. Now, I don't know what frequency crystals come up on, but carrier frequency wasn't the choice, and the transmitter made a little squeal, and we spent several more hours troubleshooting blown components. Uh, you can cause damage to the equipment. You can cause damage to yourself. It's just 
a really bad idea to uh, to be working when you're uh, so tired that you shouldn't be. And you really need to pay attention to um, learning your limits. And the other thing I found, the older I get, the more careful I am about those limits. But uh, I guess that's one of the things you learn as you go. In the line of doing what we do, we run into a lot of high voltage situations. And when I say high voltage, I don't mean the kilovolts in a plate transformer, although that's certainly a situation that uh, applies, especially with AMs, where you've got a lot of open RF circuitry as well. But even AC voltage, I mean, 200 volts AC can uh, really mess up your day. 400 volts will mess it up even faster. So one of the things that we have as a requirement here at Nautel for anybody working on live electrical equipment or any electrical equipment at all, if you're in our test room, you need a pair of shock-resistant footwear. Now, whether it's EH rated for the U.S. or ESR, electric shock resistant, which is uh, the CSA standard, the Canadian standard, the standard's the same. It's uh, They'll handle 18,000 volts across the sole without passing more than a milliamp of current. And these shoes can make the difference between getting a bad shock or not even noticing or noticing a tingle when you could have potentially noticed a significant burn. So definitely shock resistant footwear is something I recommend. You can get these type of shoes just about anywhere shoes are sold. Uh, you can find them on walmart.com if you search for EH rating. Red Wing Shoes makes them. Uh, there are several shoe stores I've found that have them. They're easy to get. They're not incredibly expensive. I've found shock resistant shoes for less than a hundred bucks a pair. And if you're working alone, at the very least, you should be protecting yourself. Something else you should, oh, one other note. You're going to notice a lot of these pictures have something wrong in them. Uh, I use these for slideshows when I'm doing SBE presentations. I use them for various other types of presentations. And so having something where you can point to it and say, what's wrong with this picture is kind of useful. And in this case, we're showing a picture of a lockout tagout. And lockout tagout is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It uh, is a really good way of making sure that nobody flips a breaker on while you're up to your elbows in the power supply. However, it's somewhat less effective if the keys are still in the locks. Now, in this particular case, I know this engineer. He's one of the better engineers around, and the keys are in the lock because he's the only guy on the site, and the locks are just there to remind him that he needs to go through and double check everything before he pulls the lock and activates the breaker. Little things like, are the protective panels back on? Have I removed grounding sticks? Is everything put back together? Just go through and double check. So they're a good reminder. They make you slow down sometimes. And really, when you get right down to it, that is critical. I mean, sometimes you're on a site, you're off the air, the phone's ringing every five minutes, the GM going, when are we going to be back on? The program director, when are we going to be back on? Your significant others asking if you're going to be home for supper. And uh, sometimes the ability to slow down and just sort of look around and make sure that everything is safe and secure before you go to the next step can mean the difference between going home and not going home, getting on air and not getting on air. Now, after you shut the breakers off and you're convinced that there's no voltage anywhere, test it anyway. Whether you use something like this volt alert pen, whether you grab a meter and measure for voltage, I don't care how you do it, but make sure that you actually do have the voltage off. Breakers will occasionally, circuit breakers will weld closed. You may have a piece of equipment with multiple power entrances. Some of our old uh, 50 kilowatt AMs had uh, two high voltage, two 480 volt entrances for the power supplies, and then another 120 volt entrance for the exciter. So sometimes just shutting the breaker off may not be enough. You may have more than one breaker to switch off, and testing things before you touch them is always a really, really good idea.
On the topic of security, anything that isn't being used should be secured whether it's tying down ladders, whether it's making sure there's no loose uh, conduit, Schedule 90 uh, pipe on the laying on the floor. There have been situations where people have been injured at transmitter sites, had nothing to do with electricity, had nothing to do with the transmitter, or anything like that. They just slipped on a piece of pipe and wrapped their head on a rack. So when you're at a site, do a walkthrough just to make sure there aren't any obstructions or trip and fall hazards, anything like that. Uh, by all means, if you are working on something up high, working on a coax switch or hard line or anything like that, use a ladder. Don't stand on a chair, especially a chair with wheels. It seems obvious, but these are the silly kind of things that uh, tend to cause most of the injuries. So these are the things you sort of, like I tell people, you don't need to be afraid of working at the transmitter site, but you do need to be careful about it. Just take a look around and make sure that there isn't anything there that could potentially be a risk, especially if you're working at the end of the day and you're already a little bit tired. One of the other tools I like is the uh, infrared camera, thermal imaging camera, the one shown on the picture is an FLIR-1, F-L-I-R-O-N-E. Um, it's made by a company called FLIR. There are other ones available. You can find them with an Amazon search. But it gives you a really fast way to see, for example, if you've got a loose connection in a circuit breaker, as the one shown on the left of the screen. It uh, can make the difference between having a site fire and not having a site fire. And a couple of hundred dollars for a camera that will plug right into your Android or Apple phone is uh, a pretty good, uh, it's pretty cheap insurance. So it's definitely something that you should consider adding to the toolbox. As I say, there are several available on Amazon in the $150 to $250 range. You can go upwards into thousands of dollars, but for what we need to accomplish, that's probably a little bit overkill. Uh, one of the things to remember, and we will mention it later on as well, is that anytime you have a stranded wire in a compression connection, like a circuit breaker, there is eventually, it's going to work loose. The copper in the wire is malleable. It will compress to displace any air left in the uh, connection and it'll become loose. Once it becomes loose, it gets hot. If it gets hot enough, bad things happen. So a little thermal scan, if you walk into a site once every couple of months, do a thermal scan of the breaker panels. It uh, will show you any hot spots or warm spots. If you see any, take the cover off the panel and do it again. And you can find exactly where you're looking at things that need to be repaired before they become big situations. So that's the sort of thing, as I say, just paying attention, looking around, being aware of your surroundings. Uh, if you're working at a remote site, uh, having security lights up, it's good to have webcams and uh, video surveillance and things like that, but those are usually only good after the fact. So at the very least, you should have those with you. One of the other things I don't have a slide for, but we treat it as extremely important here. I'd like to see all of our customers do that, is just don't go to transmitter sites alone. Have somebody else with you. All they really need to know is where's the circuit breaker to shut off the equipment that you're working on, and how do I dial 911. If they know CPR, that's an added benefit, but have somebody else there. Uh, little things like if you do slip on a piece of pipe and wrap your head on a rack, at least you've got somebody there. You're not just there on your own without any support. One of the other things I wanted to talk about was grounding. Uh, again, anybody who's heard me talk knows that this is probably one of my favorite topics. We talk about this a lot. I uh, do a lot of presentations on grounding and lightning protection. The high points are right here on the slide. Single point grounding, try to avoid ground loops. Uh, any piece of equipment should have where possible one ground connection and one ground connection only. Obviously in real life that's not going to be the case. You're going to have a transmitter for example, have shielded wire coming in with ground connections, 
you'll have conduit coming in, which is usually made of some metallic material. You'll have the ground strap, you'll have the AC safety ground. So in that case, what you're doing is working with a voltage divider principle. Look for the lightning energy to follow the lowest inductance, lowest impedance path to ground. Make that the big easy one. Conduit's got a lot of connections, a fairly high impedance, relatively speaking, so that's going to be less an issue. Anywhere where you have two ground connectors joining each other, maybe you've got this piece of equipment going to a common point and another piece of equipment going to the common point, bond the connections wherever possible. Uh, exothermic welding, uh, CAD welding, uh, silver solder, brazing, anything like that where you've got an electromechanical bond where you don't have a simple mechanical bond. Uh, Folding a piece of copper over itself and hammering it flat is not a good connection. The issue becomes eventually the copper will oxidize, it presents a higher resistance, and becomes a less attractive path for lightning energy. And that's really what we want to uh, avoid. Wherever coax cables enter a building, we like to see the shields grounded. Now, again, working with the theory that there is nothing perfect, no perfect site. This one has an issue as well. You'll notice that the grounds are looped, so they're longer than they need to be. That adds additional inductance, which adds additional resistance or impedance to lightning energy. And with the loop, well, they add some more inductance with the, uh, with the actual shape of them. So we want to keep our grounds as short and straight as possible. Now you'll also notice that in this case they're all screwed on and not bonded. Well, with a bulkhead like that, you don't have a lot of choice. You can use some NOx on them, antioxidant, to uh, keep them from oxidizing. That'll help a lot. You'll also notice that uh, we um, have a nice heavy strap going down to our reference ground point. And that's also a good thing. Again, the lightning energy has got a lot of high-frequency components to it. It's got a fast rise time in the upper end of the AM band. It's got a slow decay in the upper end of the audio band. It'll usually have a, a resonant ripple on it that's uh, at whatever frequency of any tune circuit, which in the case of a transmitter would be the antenna or the output filter. So we've got something that's carrying all of the components that our system is designed to pass. The uh, higher or the more surface area we can provide on our grounding, the better off it is, especially with the high frequency components where skin effect comes into play. So if you've got a choice between strap and cable, go with strap every time because you've got more surface area. Even a two inch strap has got more surface area than, for example, a four aught cable. Connect them to a reference ground, keep them as short as possible. As I said before, everything should be exothermically bonded. Electromechanical connections, whether it's soldered, brazed, CAD welded, less important, but the idea is to displace as much oxygen as possible and give as solid a connection as we can especially if you're running a stranded wire ground, like a quarter inch copper cable made out of stranded wire, those will, in the usual ground rod clamps, come loose over a period of time. So they need to be tightened regularly. You need to keep the oxidation off them. Or you can go to your electrical supply store, buy a ceramic mold, put it over there, touch it off, make it go boom on purpose, and you've got an exothermic weld. CAD welding is probably my favorite thing ever. We get to blow stuff up on purpose. And we don't get yelled at for it. One of the other things is making sure the ground really is ground. I don't know how many times I've shown this slide. It, it's worth a chuckle every time. In this case, the uh, guy who had installed the transmitter was told that a cold water pipe made a good ground. Somebody probably should have told them that a metal cold water pipe makes a much better ground than a PVC one. So by all means, make sure you actually are connected to ground. In the lesser extreme, a lot of times I'll walk into a site and I'll see everything connected to a nice reference ground point in the room. 
and then you'll look and discover that the ground was from an old install and it doesn't actually go anywhere. It drops into a cable trough and uh, just ends. So make sure ground is actually connected to earth somewhere. Okay, power line protectors. I am a huge fan, whether it's one of ours, whether it's one of the other brands, there's several out there, LEA, Polyphaser, Transtector, to name a few control concepts. I don't know who all's making them these days, but there are a bunch out there. Have a surge protector. Surge protectors typically are either MOVs or silicon avalanche diodes. If it's an MOV for sure, it's a bi-directional device. So if you get a spike on the tower, a tower strike and ground potential spikes high, it can clamp through the surge protectors through the MOVs dissipate out on the millions of miles of AC wiring that the power company provides and on all their grounds. So absolutely have a surge protector, have it connected to your reference ground and make sure that it's connected to the AC lines with the shortest possible run. Now you'll notice also on this one that we've also, again, what's wrong with this picture? The ground wire is run in a conduit. Conduit makes a really good shield. It's a ferro-resonant type thing, so it's basically the same as putting a ferrite on the ground lead and making it into an inductance. We don't want that. A ground wire should run straight to the reference ground point. If you have to, for a local code, run it through some sort of conduit, I'd use a PVC conduit or flex or something that has very little shielding property. Okay, so talking about ferrites, ferrites are basically rings of copper and, uh, or sorry, carbon and uh, iron filings all held together with epoxy. The great thing about ferrites for common mode signals, for lightning, for example, is that if you have equal feed and return currents, so your current coming in and your current going out are equal. The ferrite's an inert lump and totally invisible. But if you have a surge on one or the other, for example, if we had a surge here, the ferrite will saturate and attempt to induce a surge here so that the potential difference between the two stays the same. So ferrites are anywhere where you've got a feed and a return in the same cable set whether it's AC wiring with three phases going out and a safety ground coming back or a neutral, whether it's coax where you've got the feed in the center conductor and the return on the shield, whether it's shielded audio cable, anywhere where you've got the feed and the return in the same cable, the ferrite is a really good way of protecting against a common mode surge. It's got side benefits of being able to cut down power supply noise, induced RF from a co-located site, things like that. But for lightning protection, you cannot beat ferrites. Ferrites should be installed practically everywhere. All right, so where do you put ferrites? Like I said, everywhere, on the coaxes. Near the transmitter, preferably, remember your coax shield is grounded where it comes into the building, I hope. And the ferrite should be installed between that point and the transmitter itself. Where on that cable, don't really care, but between the ground point and the transmitter. Effectively, that'll make the transmitter path or the path to the transmitter look like a higher impedance than the path through ground or through the surge protector. And that's what we want to accomplish. Again, voltage divider theory. You, uh, let's see, oh, I'm reading the questions. I may come back to those in a moment. You're also going to want them on audio cables, on AC wirings. Run all your AC phases, or if you're single phase, both lines and the neutral, all through the same ferrite. Remote control cabling, AC cable to external equipment, uh, processors, remote controls, uh, STL receivers. One of the things not on this list, if you have an STL receiver, then you should have the, uh, the antenna feed, the coax for them should have ferrite on it as well. So basically, as I said, anywhere where you've got a feed and a return in the same cable, you should have a ferrite on it.
unless you want it to be a path to lightning. Uh, one of the other things that were mentioned on the first grounding slide was ground loops and uh, looking for ground loops. One of the easiest ways to eliminate ground loops is if you're installing a new piece of equipment and you want to add some grounding or you're doing some improvements to the grounding in the facility, make sure you clean up the old wiring first. Okay, anywhere where you have a parallel path or you had a connection that got broken and rather than splicing it, you ran a new wire, the old stuff should be pulled totally out. Especially remembering ground connections are frequently uninsulated copper. So one strap laying on top of another strap, well, partly it's a parallel path, partly it's a capacitor. It's uh, all kinds of things like that. So by all means, you uh, definitely want to uh, keep things as tidy as you can. Do the housekeeping to remove the old stuff when you're putting in the new stuff. All right, IT security. There was a new one not too long ago, actually a couple of days ago, there was another one. This, uh, as you can see from the date on this article, happened in uh, February. There was a little spate of them last fall. Uh, there were some happened last summer and again last week. Uh, a lot of it is uh, codecs getting hijacked. There are a lot of situations with, um, with uh, well, in the case of this one, RDS uh, generators getting hijacked. You need to practice some basic IT security. There's a uh, website called uh, Shodan that uh, you can search on by name. It's an Internet of Things search engine, uh, sort of a kind of a hacker tool if you use it wrong, but for our purposes, it gives you a really quick way of looking and seeing exactly what out there is not being protected. Uh, this picture was taken about three or four months ago, right before NAB for a presentation I did in uh, Las Vegas. I checked again yesterday, and for what it's worth, the number's gone up, not down. So we're not getting any better here. Uh, there are some very basic things that we should be doing for IT security. In that mythical perfect world, you shouldn't be able to see any piece of broadcast equipment when you do a search like this. Uh, at the very minimum, we need to do firewalls. We need to do things like VPNs. We need to do port forwarding. Now, port forwarding on its own isn't enough. It's more a useful way of connecting point A to point B without uh, having to have multiple IP addresses. Uh, definitely VPNs and firewalls are going to make the difference. If people can't see you, they're going to spend less time trying to hack you, unless they already know you're there, in which case you've got another problem. So by all means, get a firewall in place. You should have a VPN or some equivalent, and I'll be a little bit of disclosure, I'm not an IT professional by any stretch. Uh, the stuff I've learned, I've usually learned the hard way by screwing it up at least once before I actually learned it, sometimes more than once. So there are a lot of resources I tend to go to. One of the ones I like is Tech Radar, just because they tend to be fairly nonpartisan. They give you ideas. I'm sure there are several others out there. Uh, one of the things you all can do to help me out is a lot of the tips and tricks articles that, we, that I write in the uh, newsletter we put out every couple, three months are based on user suggestions. You give us ideas. Tell us what we you'd like to write about. Tell me things you've done that have worked for you. Uh, send me an email and uh, maybe it'll uh, feature in tips and tricks. So by all means, a VPN, there's free, there's subscription-based, local and remotely hosted, you know, something again so that it makes it harder for a hacker to see you at all. At the very least, have a firewall and change usernames and passwords uh, a lot of people don't know, for example, that uh, by default, a Barrett's codec comes without any username or password assigned. It's just wide open to the world, whoever hits the IP address. 
you actually had to physically go into configuration and assign username and password to it. Other things like Nautel Transmitter, it comes with uh, username and Nautel and no password. So change it to something a little more complex and uh, not password or one, two, three, four, five, or A, B, C, D, anything like that, but actually assign a username and password and remove the defaults. Don't leave the default username and password in there and just assign a new one beside it. Okay, so these are the sort of things that, uh, that people really need to, um, to pay attention to and more so now that we've got a whole bunch of IT connected equipment out there than ever before. All right, let's hit a couple of minutes on maintenance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not used to talking this long without questions. <laughs> okay, so one of the big things I run into is I'll go into a site and the first thing I'll look at is the uh, air filters on the equipment. And it's amazing how many times you'll see those air filters with a quarter inch of dust on them. And at that point, they're not incredibly effective. Oh, side note, I just saw something come in on the questions. Rick, I have a copy right beside me. Okay, uh, so at the very least, air filters should be done on a regular basis. Check the hardware, especially in power supplies, and if you're working on an AM, then with the, uh, the filter and phasers, ATUs, things like that. Again, anywhere where you've got stranded wire connections, you get a potential for stuff to work loose. Anywhere you've got heating and cooling, day timer where you're at daytime AM where your transmitter's on some of the day, off some of the day, those things can work loose, things like that. Um, air handling, check belts and blowers, ground system, look for the integrity, and just general housekeeping stuff. So with air filters, there's no real, we can't tell you how often to replace your air filters. It's going to vary. I've got sites where they're replaced almost weekly, especially in pollen season. I've got other sites where they may not have been replaced in two or three years. The sites are well sealed and air conditioned and there's just no dirt getting in there. Um, if you've got metal mesh filters on a piece of equipment, they can be taken out and washed, hosed out, taken to a car wash, a touchless car wash, whatever. If you do wash metal mesh filters, number one, be sure they're dry before you put them back in and blow all that water through the transmitter. Number two, a lot of metal mesh filters require filter coat, a, a sort of a gummy substance that sprays onto the filter media to allow them to attract and hold the dust in the air. So if you do have that type of filter, make sure that you put the filter coat on them as well. Okay, hardware checks, again, compression connections like circuit breakers, like grounds to ground rods, or ground wires to ground rods, um, anything that's got uh, fan or blower vibration, heating, cooling cycles, filter connections, grounds. Uh, that's a picture of me several decades ago doing some uh, basic, again, hardware maintenance on the um, power module for an ND series AM. So this should be done, ideally it'll vary again depending on your situation, but uh, you're going to want to do it at least every year or two. Especially when you think about it, a transmitter's full of fans or has a big blower, it's sitting there vibrating and shaking hardware loose all the time. And yeah, when we build it, we torque stuff down. We have specific torque settings for everything. Uh, I'm sure other manufacturers do too, but it, you are going to want to check that stuff on a regular basis, especially in the power supply and high voltage circuits, because there's nothing better than a high voltage or high current power supply with a loose connection in it. Nothing better for the light show and entertainment value and our parts department will love you. You may not be such a fan. 
So go through on a regular basis when you can, and just these things should be checked and tightened. Of course, you're going to want to take it off air. So this is where either having an aux transmitter or having scheduled off air time is going to be a requirement. All right. Sometimes that's hard to uh, hard to accommodate with uh, some owners. Some budgets tend to run a little tighter than others, but it is really something. The analogy I use is that uh, it costs a lot less money to get your oil changed than it does to replace your motor every two years. Something like that. And again, groundskeeping, just general housekeeping sort of things. Um, make sure that your ground system still exists. Uh, this particular case was a uh, AM site, grounded beautifully in the uh, transmitter building, very well done. And we were wondering why they were losing the power on modules on a fairly regular basis. Went out to do a site inspection, pushed some of the vines and brush away from the ground egress from the building, discovered the strap had been cut off. And all the radials and most of the strap was actually gone from the site. So grounds don't do their job if they're physically not there. Seems obvious, but it's the case. Definitely any looser wires for stuff that's been replaced and isn't being used, those things should be removed. I mean, number one, they have an effect on tuning. They can have an effect on lightning protection. You're adding weight and wind load to the tower and adding stress to it. As you can tell from the picture of this particular tower, it's uh, got enough stress on it already. Or then again, some towers, the uh, extra coax may be the only thing holding them up. Don't put yourself in that situation if you can avoid it at all. Okay, definitely clean the dust out of it here and again. As you can tell in this particular picture from the rust on the uh, transformer, or sorry, on the choke in this one, this is a fairly humid site. This uh, whole non-condensing humidity thing just doesn't apply in this particular location. So when you have a whole bunch of dirt on things, dirt and a whole bunch of humidity, you've got something that could potentially be conductive. And at that point, you can end up having more problems than you're trying to avoid. So by all means, at least go in with a shop vac and uh, clean it out. A lot of people like to brush and compressor. I prefer to vacuum just because I like to know that the dirt's actually been removed from the transmitter and not relocated to a different place. But clean it out for sure. All right. And if you've got this particular situation, well, sometimes it's easier to start over. Uh, I told somebody once, it seems like there's always enough money to do it over, but there's almost never enough to do it right. Um, the funny thing is, like I said earlier, you can pay a little now or you can pay a lot later. Uh, so definitely these are the sort of things we want to look at. We want to um, try to keep things as tidy as we can, both from a safety perspective and from an equipment reliability perspective. Uh, this particular case, we've got an AM here with the vines growing up around it. On a rainy day, it's probably seeing a lot of SWR type shutbacks. Anything like that. Those are the sort of things that it's easy to overlook, but they're really, really critical when it comes to making sure that we get this sort of thing done. Now, we've got a lot of different places you can get information about things like this. Uh, things like our Waves newsletter, the uh, webinars such as this one, they're all archived on our website. We have a YouTube channel and, of course, personal plug, the tips and tricks articles I write every couple of months are archived going back six or seven years, I think, something like that. So you can find a lot of this stuff on our website. If there's some piece of information you are looking for, by all means, please, please, please send me an email. And uh, especially for the tips and tricks, I try to keep that very generic. I don't want it to be Nautel or sales oriented. I try to keep it more industry related. So if there's something that's important to what you need for your day-to-day -day job or what you encounter in your, your work every day, those are the kind of things that we really want to uh, try to address in tips and tricks.
I mean, I can write sales brochures all day long, but that's not nearly as much fun. All right, I'm going to wrap that up at this point. Let's go back and hit some questions. We have a bunch of them here. And uh, some questions, some comments. So John Lackness, for example, hey, John, uh, you can't see me waving, but I am, mentioned talking about the, uh, the FLIR1 that I uh, talked about. This is where I get to skip back through the slideshow and uh, give everybody a bit of vertigo. But the uh, thermal imaging camera, he mentioned that there is uh, one available from Home Depot that's a cell phone and FLIR or thermal imaging camera all in one. Okay, um, Paul had asked what is the name of this device and I think it's related to this. It's at about the same time point. Um, Paul, this is an FLIR1. Let's see if I can turn a pen in here. Uh, F L I. Whoops. R O N E. Okay, there you go. There's the. Uh, I know our marketing people are in the other room just cringing right now, but uh, F L I R one is the uh, is the specific model of this one. And uh, absolutely, they do, uh, they do make a difference. All right, uh, John had noticed in a slide that a ferrite was located right at the entrance bulkhead. And where the ferrite is located, like I had mentioned, is less important. You were probably looking at this one right here, John. And where the ferrite's located is less critical. What I find more important is that the ferrite, in this case, looks like it's actually before, assuming it is a ferrite, and that wouldn't be as good. I'd rather see the ferrite on this side of the ground kit. Okay, putting it over there just adds an impedance and makes it harder for lightning energy to get to the ground. So definitely in this particular picture, that'd be another case of what's wrong with this picture. You want the ferrite on the load side. Okay, does a bigger ferrite provide a better protection? That's from Alex. Uh, the answer basically is no. Uh, the What matters with ferrites is the permeability. So what is the ratio of iron to carbon, for, for, for example? Uh, if you're looking, there's a website, a uh, company called Amidon, A-M-I-D-O-N. And Amadon lists their ferrites by cutoff frequency as well as material. We use uh, J material and uh, let's see, H5C2 material in most of our ferrites, depending on the manufacturer. But for our purpose, where we're doing common mode protection, where we've got same feed and same return and don't really care about the frequency of what's going through the cable normally, only looking at lightning energy, we want the lowest cutoff frequency we can get. So if you're looking at the Amidon website, shoot for the lowest cutoff frequency you can get. That would be more important than the actual physical size of the ferrite. Okay. Hal. Hey, Hal. How are you doing? Um, has a polyphaser surge protector on the STL line? Am I suggesting ferrites in addition? Uh, Hal, if that's the polyphaser, the little series gas gaps that screw into the coax, then yes, because all you've got there is a shunt type gap to ground. It doesn't really, it, it will shunt excess energy on the line after you pass the breakdown voltage of the gas gap. But up until that point, any common mode noise will still walk right through and the ferrites will help to block that. So definitely ferrites, they're inexpensive. You can get uh, ferrites that fit over an STL line for less than 10 bucks each. So absolutely, I'd throw a couple of them on there. And in this case, if the polyphaser, if the polyphaser is connected to a bulkhead ground, I'd put them between the polyphaser and the equipment. Okay, where should ferrites be installed on AC cables to tower lights or to cables for STL gigahertz radios? And the short answer to that is if your AC cables to tower lights, they'll go through a lighting choke of some kind, whether it's a uh, bifiler uh, lightning choke, whether it's an Austin transformer, whether it's 
whatever. Uh, typically, I'd put those ferrites toward the uh, transmitter building, probably right in the transmitter building itself. Um, for cables for STL gigahertz radio, same basic deal. Uh, if the coax is grounded where it enters the building, then I'd want the ferrite be between the radio and the grounding of the coax shield. All right. Uh, Dan Mamone wants to know, should audio or AC power cables be fed through a ferrite more than once, i.e. looped? And the answer is yes. If you can and you have the link to cable available, certainly loop the ferrites. Um, the, what you're going to find <coughs> is uh, when you loop a ferrite, the more turns you can get on it, the more you increase the inductance to lightning energy. While you, while you don't make any difference at all to the impedance that the regular circuit, the audio circuit or AC circuit would see. So certainly if you can loop the ferrite, that's going to be limited by cable size, the whole diameter in the ferrite, the length of cable you've got to work with. But if you can do it, absolutely it's a good idea. Okay, is it advisable to connect the protection rod direct to grounding system or better to connect the Raw ground separately. I'm guessing we're talking AC protection versus lightning protection or AC entrance ground, like the power company ground. And Paul, uh, on that one, it will depend somewhat in your local code. Here in North America, the NEC has been rewritten as of, I want to say about 10 years ago, give or take to specify that AC entrance ground definitely should, actually must, be tied to facility ground. So your, uh, your lightning protection ground must be tied to your AC ground here in, in this part of the world. Uh, local codes will always be more, uh, more applicable, so that one I can't really answer depending what part of the world you're in. But if you're in the U.S. or Canada, then yes, they must be tied together. What can you do when the owners won't get you the items that you need to do what you need to do? That is where the oil change analogy comes in. Um, typically, an owner that won't buy the gear, that the things needed to do the job, whether it's basic maintenance, whether it's allowing you the time to do basic maintenance, whether it's hiring a contract guy to do, basic things like air conditioner maintenance. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you an example of that. I just got off the phone with a customer about an hour before this webinar started. Um, they're in the process of replacing an $8,000 HD exporter because their air conditioning, well, the, their tower owner, in this case, not the station owner, they're different, leased, uh, leased site, but the tower owner had been skimping on air conditioner maintenance. The drain hole plugged in the uh, condensate pan for the air conditioner till the pan overflowed and uh, poured water all over the top of a rack. So now that company gets to replace about $20,000 worth of gear because they wouldn't spend $500 to get the air conditioning guy out once a year to do basic maintenance. So. About the only thing you can do in a situation like that is become a salesperson. You need to sell the value of what you're doing against the cost of what will happen if you don't do it. And a lot of times, I'll, especially if I'm talking to somebody non-technical, tie it to their car or their house or something that's a little more familiar and uh, not as foreign as transmitters and transmitter sites. Okay, again to Paul, how often should we check that the grounding strap or wire is still okay, as well as tightness, tightness of dishes, arms, brackets, etc.? Again, this is a little situational. If it's a strap and it's brazed, you don't really need to check it at all. If it's a clamp configuration, it will vary depending on uh, heating cooling cycles. Uh, if you're in an area where the earth vibrates a little more often, you're going to check that stuff a little more often. So uh, it's basically the answer is as often as you need to, to be sure that it actually stays secure. Um, OK. 
Okay, Christopher had one that just says question for the end. Christopher, I don't see the end of that. Let's see. Oh, wait, there it is going down further. Okay, I see it. We'll scroll down and get to that in a moment. John's talking about the uh, terminal imager that uh, is on the Home Depot website. It's labeled Caterpillar, about 450 bucks. Um, Bob's just telling me that uh, we some of the things we suggested at one of his sites actually worked. Yeah, Bob. We like it when things don't blow up. I mean, we don't mind selling you the first transmitter, but we don't want to have to sell you the second one because the first one blew up. Uh, Dave wants to talk about Spark Apps at AM sites, and that is a really good topic. I'm going to uh, leave this slide up here for a moment while I skip to my, let's see, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to skip to PowerPoint and see if I can find this real quick. Uh, I don't need to so much. Uh, Spark apps at AM sites definitely do need to be checked on a regular basis. If you have tungsten balls or uh, brass spark apps, they will tend to, every time they arc, a little bit of metal will migrate from one ball to the other. And what that does is creates peaks on one ball and valleys in the other, and you lose total control over the voltage at which they arc. Uh, I like to see polished carbon balls. You'll notice on the... Uh, Transmitters we provide now, anything with an air gap in it, that's usually how we do it. Uh, and they should be set, basically I call it the hammer whack method. You whack them together until they just start to arc under modulation and then back them up till they don't. We do have a uh, spreadsheet that can calculate ball gap setting for just about anything. So absolutely, there are... Uh, there are um, things that need to be done with uh, with spark balls. I don't like the Jacob's ladder type, the the ones where you got the bent wires or the V-shaped pieces of flat steel. They're pretty common in ATUs, and they're a good rough thing. But again, metal migrates, so after they arc once or twice, you're just not going to be able to uh, to um, control where they are. So they're not a bad idea, but uh, ball gaps, a properly set set of, uh, of carbon, polished carbon balls will uh, go a long, long way. There's a company in California called Ross Engineering that uh, makes polished carbon balls that are pre-tapped for a quarter 20 bolt. So you can uh, build your own set of spark gaps in very little time and under a couple of hundred bucks. I'm getting a wrap-up notice from over on the other side. He's just worried about the length of his recording. We're going to talk for a little minute and just drive him crazy. Okay, uh, question for the end. Let's see. Um, yes, Mike Glazer, that's a good point. Uh, the FLIR1 is an add-on to either an Android or iPhone, and you do need to specify which one. Uh, Lisa Lewis, what do you think of static dissipators mount out, mounted on top of a tall tower? Uh, do you think they help prevent lightning strikes? That's a loaded question, Lisa. Uh, the short answer is I don't think they prevent them all by any stretch. Where they're incredibly useful is when the tower starts to ionize as the lightning storm approaches and you get a lot of, of, uh, a lot of uh, ball gap arcing or uh, guy wire insulator arcing. And static dissipators, point discharge dissipators, will make a, a big difference in that sort of thing. If you get static created by wind-driven sand or, in our area, snow, they'll help in that as well. So, yes, they make a difference. Do they prevent lightning strikes? I'm not totally convinced. But, uh, but yes, they do make a difference. Okay, uh, multiple ferrites on the line, helpful. Steve, yeah, they are. Um, you do hit a point of diminishing returns. One is good, two is better. After that, you start getting into the area of wasting money. I uh, see David uh, asked the same question. So, yeah, I like to see two on there, but any more than that is just, I wouldn't bother. Uh, do Austin rings qualify for lightning protection? No, they do not because there is a big air gap between them and there are a lot of components of lightning that will not cross that gap. They're designed to uh, couple AC. 
So the, uh, they'll block the higher frequency component of the lightning, which will travel right on down the coax. Uh, ferrite cores on any ground runs? Uh, no, definitely not. Don't put ferrite on grounds. Uh, okay, again, search protector for our VS300. We're thinking of buying a 220 volt UPS. Do you think this would give us more lightning protection? If you get a uh, dual conversion UPS, then yes, where the, uh, the batteries always provide the power and the AC wall entry is just used to charge the batteries. Otherwise, no. And remember that the only thing guaranteed to fail more than a UPS is a generator. So uh, don't rely totally on the UPS. The surge protector and grounding will give you the best lightning protection. Definitely, though, the UPS is not a bad idea. All right, uh, we are hitting the limit on time, so I see another six or seven questions, but uh, we, uh, we're just flat out of time. We're going to wrap it up. I'll skip her back to the end of the uh, presentation here. And one other thing, you are going to get a request to do a survey at the end of this. Uh, absolutely, if you fill it in, it uh, helps us tailor both future webinars and anything that uh, I might write about tips and tricks. Uh, I can be writing about something that you suggested or I can be writing about something I saw at your site, you choose. Uh, or if, again, you found a way to do something that uh, makes it easier for us to find ways to get this job done with uh, the budgets that we've all got to play with. All right, so it's been a pleasure, folks. I will handle the rest of the questions by email. Uh, the website will be archived shortly. Definitely you'll be getting the surveys. And uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.